All right, good morning, everybody. If you go ahead and take your Bibles and turn this morning, let me find the right one. Let's go ahead and turn to Psalm, Psalm 37. Psalm 37, we're going to be looking at verses 23 through 29. Psalm 37, the Bible says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread." He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil, and do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land, and dwell therein forever. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, I thank you for everybody who's here. And Lord, I just pray that uh, you give me the words to say today as we look at the good man, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that, uh, that uh, the message you have to be heard would be heard this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Steps of a Good Man there was once a man who was given the chance to apply for a promotion at his job. It was a great opportunity for his career, as well as having the chance to further advance. The new position would mean moving to a different city. Luckily, it was a beautiful town, had good schools, had parks, had every kind of service one could possibly need. The raise that would come with this new position would mean that he would never have to worry about his finances ever again. His children's college paid for. In fact, his children would also be financially ahead in life, if not set up for life. As a father, this is what he had been striving for his whole life. A way to provide for his family without ever having another financial care. There was only one problem. While there was a service that covers every need him and his family could ever need have, there was nothing that town to provide for his own or his family's spiritual need. He would be leaving, leaving his spiritual anchor behind. That one person keeping him accountable. That one person who led him to the Lord. That one person who called him Saturday and said, You're going to be in church tomorrow, right? He'd be leaving a good church that had been behind him, that had been helping him grow, that had been supporting him. He'd be leaving a pastor that cared for him, a pastor who looked after his flock's needs. He'd be leaving that all behind. This new church or this new city has no church for him and his family to step into. What should he do? Today's society is on a mission to destroy the importance of fatherhood. It's been tearing down the importance of the father being the caretaker for his home, the provider for his family. It has blurred the lines to say that anybody can be the caretaker. Anybody can provide. It has even gone so far that we, have, we are seeing a lot of families where the mother is a financial provider. The father, he's just there. Hollywood likes to depict men as being couch potatoes. They like to depict young men as being video game enthusiasts who have a woman in their life to support their video gaming. Society is on a mission. When it does promote a good father or a good man, that man is often categorized only as a man who can financially provide for his family above any possible need that could ever arise. 
He's a workaholic. A man who spends 24-7 in a job making money. When Hollywood and society decides to depict a good man, that is the good man in their eyes. The man that isn't there, but he's providing everything they could ever need and the family can live as they want, how they want, and care for nothing. Now it is a father's prerogative and it is a father's duty to care for his, for his family. A father and a husband is supposed to do just that. But even before the world started to degrade a father's role in financial provision, society sought to destroy the father's role in spiritual guidance. They have... There was a time in society where society made it seem as though church and God was for the wife and kids only. They destroyed the importance of having a father figure leading the family in spiritual matters. And now society is even searching to destroy the father's leading in any capacity. There are those who would make us believe that a father, if need be, if he is widowed, can provide the position of both father and mother. That, there is no, that a man can do that completely. It also tries to tell us that a woman can provide the mother and father needs to a child. And while a single father or a single mother can be the parent that their children needs them to be, they cannot take place of the other. We still need fathers and we still need mothers. The point of my story was to show that the spiritual aspect must be considered in any path. The father of a house must consider the spiritual needs of his family before looking to the financial needs. This was a good financial move for this man. There was wealth to be gained. There was position to be gained. There was prestige to be gained. There was care for his family. And there was an inheritance to be given to his children. But he didn't stop to consider the spiritual needs that his family had. I want us to go ahead and turn over this morning to Genesis in chapter 13. Many of us are going to be familiar with this, but coming out of the psalm, especially Psalm 37, where we, where we read about the steps of a good man being ordered by the Lord, I want us to look at two men, Abram and Lot, who were faced with a decision. They were faith, faced with a path that they had to choose. They had, to choose, they had to make a decision. Go ahead and look in chapter 13. And if you look down in verse 5, it says, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. Lot and Abram had become very wealthy men. They had large herds. They had many servants. Verse 7, And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled in the, then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we be brethren." Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then will I go to the right. Or if thou shalt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. The plain of Jordan, Moses describes it and compares it to the Garden of Eden. 
before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. This was a very, very wealthy land. It was an abundant land. Look in verse 11, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was departed from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. I think we're all fairly familiar with the stories of, or the, the lives of Lot and Abraham. Lot is Abraham's nephew. And up until this time, he had been traveling with him from Ur to Bethel, down to Egypt, and now back to Bethel. Lot has seen Abraham answer the call of God, and he has followed Abram. But now it's time for Lot to make his own independent decision. It's time for him to separate from Abram and do his own thing. It's time for Lot to be promoted to the head of his own household, independent from Abraham. Abraham was not his father. Lot was probably, at least in his early 20s, by the time they left Ur, he was the inheritor of his father's herds, of his father's wealth. He's a young man. He was probably, in a sense, not necessarily raised by Abraham and Abraham's father, but there was a sense of guidance there. There was a replacement of the father figure because Lot had lost his. So Abraham is the guide for him now. He is the, he is the man, he is the main man in his life leading him and guiding him. He is, as we looked, as I had said in my story, Lot's spiritual anchor. He is what's holding Lot's relationship with God together. It was time to separate. And as he looks out across the land, he sees the plain of Jordan. And the Bible tells us that it was even as the garden of the Lord. And it was like the land of Egypt. This is well watered and enticing land for a herdsman. With plenty of room to grow the herd. There was just one problem. It was in the same plain as Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, the plain was rich and plentiful for the herd to grow, but it was barren to the needs of Lot's spiritual relationship with God. It was barren. There was no provision for Lot in his spiritual needs. But Lot was allured to the bountiful land and the potential for great wealth, and he chose that path based on what his eyes saw. There was no time of consideration. We don't see that he asked Abram's counsel, let alone asking God to direct his path. He ordered his own steps. He did not stop to consider what path God might have established for him. I'm sure that if he would have asked Abraham, Abram, where do I go? Uncle, where do you think I should go? Where should I grow for my herd to grow? Where do you think I should go? And Abram would have told him, anywhere. Go to the north. Go to the south. Go to the east. Anywhere. But I think if Lot would have said, I want to go to the plain of Jordan, I think Abraham would have told him, Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah is down there. It's a dangerous spot for you. We know that in Abraham's life, Abraham himself had fallen a few times and he had, he had walked in the own path that he had ordered instead of walking in the path that God ordered for him. And so, but I think Abraham would have realized, well, I don't think Sodom and Gomorrah is a good place for you. Now, maybe if he had asked Abraham that and Abraham had told him that, he would have said, you just don't want me to go down there in that nice plain. You don't want my sheep to be well watered. You don't want my, my cattle to be well grazed. He said, look at that. It's rich. It's plentiful. It's bountiful. But the Bible doesn't tell us that conversation ever happened. All it says is that he looked at the plain, and it was good. And he chose that plain. 
and then he pitched his tent toward Sodom. Let's look at Abram. When coming back up from Egypt, the first thing that Abram did was to return to Bethel, where he had first made an altar to God upon first arriving in the land of Canaan. And there at that altar, he called upon the name of the Lord. Then when strife arose, he gave Lot his choice of the land. And after Lot chose the Jordan plain, Abram went into the land of Canaan. There God showed him all the land that he would give Abram and his seed forever. God had a path ordered for Abram. And Abraham stepped down that path. Now, the good man. I don't, want, I don't want you to think that because Abraham was good, God ordered a path for him. And I don't want you to think that because Lot was evil, that God allowed him to go down his own path. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. God orders a path. The good man is the man who chooses that path and delights in that path. Lot was not a bad man. 2 Peter 2, in verse 7 and 8 says, And delivered just Lot, vexed with, his filthy, with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Peter tells us that Lot was a just man, a righteous man, who let himself get vexed, who allowed his soul to be vexed, who allowed the filthiness the unlawfulness, the wickedness of Sodom to influence his life. What made Abraham a good man? It was because he went down the path that God chose for him. It's because when God called him and said, Abraham, I want you to get up and go, Abraham got up and went, not knowing the way he was going. It's like playing some sort of weird game where you just have to listen to the GPS and you have no idea what the GPS is doing or taking you to. It's like asking somebody else to, unbeknownst to you, type in the address on a GPS and telling you, follow it, and then you blindfolded follow the GPS, listening carefully for when that little person in there says, turn left. Turn right. Recalculating. Now, God never has to recalculate. He guided Abraham step by step. But just imagine that, following a GPS blindly. Abraham was following God blindly. God didn't tell him, Abraham, you're going to Canaan. Listen to me and I'll tell you which way to turn along the way. He said, Abraham, get up and let's go. Let's go and I'll lead you. Romans tells us that it was not because of Abraham's own righteousness. It wasn't because of his works that he did. Rather, it was his obedience that he was deemed a righteous man. The good man is a good man when he follows God's guidance. Abraham walked after God, and he stopped and considered his own spiritual needs and that of his family, and he sought after God's guidance. In verse 3 of chapter 13, it says, And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. He was searching after God's guidance. Now, if you remember why he was down in Egypt, he had gone down in Egypt because of a famine. He was not supposed to go down there. And there was trouble down in Egypt. He lied to Pharaoh. Pharaoh took Sarah. 
Sarah was a beautiful woman, and, and, and Pharaoh took him for his own. And when he asked Abraham, Abraham said, she's my sister. In that moment, Abraham could have lost Sarah, could have been stripped of his wealth, could have been cast out of Egypt for lying to Pharaoh. Instead, when trouble arose in Pharaoh's house, and Pharaoh came and asked Abraham, he didn't ask him, he told him, you lied to me. Why didn't you tell me this is your wife? He said, I was scared of you. I was scared that you might kill me and take my wife. Now God's hand was in it. God was preserving His promise that He made to Abraham that a seed would come from him and Sarah. And Abraham came out of Egypt, a wealthier man. The dowry that Pharaoh had given Abraham for Sarah, he allowed Abraham to keep. That was a king's ransom for a bride. It made him a wealthy man, a wealthier man. But when he came out of Egypt, the first thing Abraham did is when he came back into the promised land, he stopped and he said, okay, I'm going to make sure I know where I'm going this time. I'm going to stop and check the map. I'm going to stop and ask for God's guidance. Lot was on that high place with Abraham, but Lot, look, Lot looked down at the plain and temptation whispered in his ear, doesn't that look good? That could all be yours. It sounds a lot like what Satan did to Jesus Christ in the wilderness. Look at the kingdoms of the earth. All of this I can give to you if you bow down. We as Christians today, we get that same temptation. That little tempter sits there and whispers in our ear. That looks good, doesn't it? That promotion would really help. That promotion would cover a lot of debt. That move would really be good for you and your family. And it whispers these things, speaking to our carnal selves, to our, to our inward man, telling us all the good things that we could get from this choice. And it blocks out the thought, what do, what do I need spiritually? What do my children need? Is it better for me to go get this job, to put them in a public school, to pay their way through a public or, or through a private school, send them off to college, and they'll be ahead in life, and I can give them, give them an inheritance, and they can go off and start some business or whatever, not buy a house? Or should I stop and think, what will happen if I do go there? What will happen with their walk with God in that instance? Are they better off here where we're just ma barely making it, but they're growing in God? They're beginning to take the steps of a good man? Are they beginning to follow after God? Lot was a just man, but his relationship with God wasn't anchored in his own convictions. Abraham's relationship was anchored in his own convictions. Abraham's relationship was anchored in his, own, in, the, in his own experiences of seeing God provide for him and lead him and guide him. Lot was just holding on and following Abraham. Lot wasn't being guided. Lot wasn't being told what to do. Lot, wasn't, Lot was just, I'm going to hang on with Abraham. He got to see all that God did through Abraham's life. But when, when it was time for Lot to step out on his own... He didn't have an anchor other than Abraham. And when that anchor was gone, he began to drift. He began to look around. And yes, maybe moving into the plain of Jordan wasn't a bad thing if he had pitched his tent on the opposite side of the valley to the north of the valley away from Sodom. But the Bible tells us that he pitched his tent toward Sodom. So that when he got out of his tent every morning, he looked and he saw the city walls. That he saw the merchants going in and out. And if you remember the story of Lot and you were to read it again and think about it, slowly Lot, he was pitched outside of Sodom towards Sodom. Then he was sitting in the gate, an influential man. Then he was living in the city. His daughters were married to the men of the city. I don't know if Lot was married prior to the move or after he moved to Sodom. 
We don't, it doesn't say anything. He, Lot might have married a woman from Sodom. His family was tied in there. Abraham had left. Abraham had gone out to the northwest. He was out over in the Canaan land, traveling around. Lot had a steady home. He wasn't a pilgrim anymore. He wasn't, he, he wasn't a traveling herdsman like Abraham was. He had a home. He had influence. He had position. He had prestige. He had wealth. Abraham's influence was replaced with Sodom's influence. And Lot's righteous soul was vexed. What does this have to do with Father's Day? Well, it's because I want us as fathers to remember that the decisions we make in life have a spiritual impact as well. We as fathers will make spiritual decisions in life that will affect our children. Look at these two men. Abram became Abraham, the father of nations, blessed in his old age with Isaac, the promised seed. He saw God work and provide in his life and in the life of Isaac. When, when asked to sacrifice Isaac, he obeyed and went up into the mount. And Isaac said, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham couldn't answer him. And I bet he choked up. He had tears in his eyes. And I think Isaac said, Oh, I think I know. But he himself was obedient and willing, trusting that God would provide for his father. And when they got there, and he allows Abraham to tie him up, don't, don't misunderstand, Isaac is a strong, I'm assuming a strong, at least a wiry teenage boy. Abraham is an old, old man. He couldn't chase Isaac back down the mountain. I mean, Isaac might have outrun him, but Abraham, if he tried, would have gone head over heels and just tumbled, and he would have beat him to the bottom. But he allowed Abraham to tie him up and put him on that altar. And when the knife went up, the angel grabbed his hand, and there was a ram in the thicket. Abraham was provided for. He was watched after. He was guided by God. He was given in his old age children that would, be, that would become many nations. But Lot, he became wealthy. He had two daughters. He became influential. But he was surrounded by wickedness. He was surrounded by filthiness. He was surrounded by abhorrent behavior. And eventually he lost his wife, his property, his wealth, and his children. Abraham considered the spiritual, and Lot did not. In Psalms 37, after reading the lives of Abraham and Lot... There's a lot, there is a lot in Lot's life that adds, adds substance to the warnings given in Psalm 37. Let's go ahead and go back to Psalm 37. We're going to go ahead and look at some of these. And I think sometimes as we read through the Psalms or we read a passage in the Bible, especially in Psalms and Proverbs, and we see all these warnings telling us, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, this will become of that, this will happen because of this, and we read those things and it's kind of abstract, it's kind of like, okay. But if you, if you put Psalm 37 in with the life of Lot, those warnings gain substance. Verse 3 through 7. I am in 37. Yes, 3 through 7. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. 
and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently on him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. This is Abraham. This was the kind of man Abraham was. He followed after God. He delighted in the Lord. He did good. And I think a lot of those verses kind of describe how Abraham's life went. Verses 10 and 11. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. I think Lot... If he had just stopped and considered and followed after God, eventually the desires of Lot's heart being aligned with what God wanted for him, he would have gained those things. Abraham's herds never suffered from drought, starvation, pestilence, death. And he went out in the wilderness. Lot looked down at the valley and he said, My cattle will never starve. My cattle will never thirst. They will thrive and I can become wealthy. And what happened? He didn't consider that fire from heaven might come down and consume it all. Consider the place. Diligently consider his place and it shall not be. Even to this day we can consider and consider and consider. And where is Sodom and Gomorrah? It's gone. You look at that valley today, and that valley is not what Genesis tells us it was. Verse 11, But the meek shall inherit, shall inherit the earth, and shall delight thyself in the abundance of peace. I don't think from the minute that Lot stepped down into that plain, he delighted in an abundance of peace. He was carried away captive Abraham had to come and save him. And then he was rescued by two angels. Tell him, Lot, get out of here, or you too will be consumed by fire. Verses 14 through 16. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. The men of Sodom diligently destroyed Lot's Um, what's the word? Spirituality, Spirituality but Lot's um, testimony. They diligently destroyed that. They couldn't have destroyed it better had they drawn the sword and drawn back the bow and killed him. Because at, at least then he would have died a righteous man, a good man. But instead they whittled away his testimony and finally he became a man of Sodom. Verse 15, their sword, their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. They were destroyed. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. Even if had Abraham gone out into the wilderness and be left with 50 goats that him and Sarah looked after for the rest of their lives, they would have been in abundance of peace with God. As long as they were following after God, they would have been content and happy, joyful, more so than Lot with all his riches dwelling in Sodom and Gomorrah and seeing the wickedness that was happening. And while not partaking in it, a sliver of his conscience sat in, inside of him and it was mortified. It was, it was devastated by what it was saw. It was, he was, it was traumatized by the wickedness that was going on. When the two angels came to save Lot and they knocked on the door, he invited them in with hospitality. We see that spark of, of Abraham's hospitality. We see the spark of, of Abraham's characteristics. And he welcomes them in. He brings them in and he feeds them and he clothes them. And then when the men of Sodom come and bang on his door and says, You let those two guys come out. We want to... Wickedness. Now Lot, at first, it sounds good. He stands at his door and he says, No, men, no, I will not. You will not have them. 
But then the influence of Sodom comes in. He says, take my daughters instead. Wickedness. What father could think of that? And that was purely because of the influence of that city. That city was wicked. And, and I think if he had stayed with Abraham, that moment would have changed. He would have stood at his door and said, no. You can kill me at my doorstep, but you are not coming in this house. The door is barred, and I will keep you away from this door as long as I can till I myself die. That's what I believe Abraham would have done. But Lot, because his soul was vexed, because his righteousness was twisted, because he had been there too long in the world, he offered a compromise. Wickedness. Verse 18, the Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and they shall inherit, and their inheritance shall be forever. He told Abraham, look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, look to the west. All this land will be yours and your seed forever, an inheritance forever. Verse 20, but the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, they shall consume away. Verse 23 through 25, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and am now old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging. David had seen a lot in his days. David witnessed a lot. And while David wasn't always a perfect man, he was never a perfect man. And even when he sinned, God never forsook him. God still ha held him by the hand. And it's like when you're walking with a toddler, and the toddler stumbles and falls or throws a fit and goes, but you still hold on to their hand. Sometimes you go, are you done throwing a fit? And will you walk? Or do I got to drag you till you want to stand up? And sometimes it's like, are you okay? Now let's get up and let's keep going. That's what God does. That's what David said God did for him. Though the righteous man fall, he will not be cast out. A father, when his child falls, doesn't go, okay, you're done. Walk by yourself. No, the father says, come on. If you threw a fit and you fell down, get over it. Let's keep going. Or we can just drag you. But when he stumbles and falls, that hand is still there. Won't utterly cast him out, but holds on to lift him back up. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. David went through some hard times. I seem to remember he was in a cave by himself with just the few men that followed him. Saul and the armies, the armies that David had once fought for, were surrounding him, seeking to kill him. That almost sounds forsaken. But Paul, or David wasn't forsaken. God was with him. And he knew that. And he wrote psalms during that time. He wrote songs praising God, even when he was in the wilderness, hunted like a wild animal. Verse 28, For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. Judgment does come. And judgment, and God came and he talked to Abraham and he told him, Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And what did Abraham do? He chose to Negotiate. He said, well, well, God, would you destroy it if there was 50 men in Sodom and Gomorrah, 50 righteous men? No, I won't destroy it, Abraham. I won't destroy it for 50. Abraham goes, yeah, you might be a hard time finding 50 men in Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, God, okay, not 50, not 50. How about 25? 25 men. God says, for 25 righteous, I will not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He goes, man, he's caving in hard, caving in real easy. I think 25 is a tall order. Ten men. Ten men. Would you preserve the city of wickedness for ten men? Yeah, Abraham, for ten men. I will. Abraham goes, oh, five? 
would you do five? And God said, Abraham, for five, I would. And I think that at that moment, Abraham realized, Lot's done nothing down there. Five. Lot, his wife, his two daughters, and their sons, or and their, their husbands. That's six. If Lot had been the spiritual influence that he should have been as a man and as a father, six men would have been sufficient, six people would have been sufficient to preserve Sodom and Gomorrah. But he wasn't. Lot hadn't. There was one man, and that one man was vexed. That one man was corrupted. Verses 34 through 40. Wait on the Lord and keep His way, and He shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. He's gone. There's not even evidence of him being there. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright. For the end of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is, in, is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in Him. You would have thought after being rescued once by Abraham and then being rescued by two angels, Lot would have turned back to God. But when you read the end of Lot's life, you see no such thing. You see him getting drunk, his daughters getting him drunk, and you see wickedness. He never turned back to God. He never set up an altar. His days, the end of his days, were not peaceful. You look at the life of Abraham, with the faults, with the disobedient times, you see the end of a man, or the end, the, the end of a man's days being days of peace, being, de, being days of prosperity. Not that when we walk with God, we will become prosperous men as the world might consider, but we will be prosperous the way God wants us to be. Full of peace. Full of joy. Hopefully children that are walking after God. Children that are adding to the riches of their father the riches that are being put up in heaven. We have a duty as fathers to be good men. We have that duty. We can't Decline that. We can't disobey that. That is an order that we must follow. We have to be good men. Men who walk down the path that God has ordered for us. We have a duty to show our children the delight that is the Lord's way. If you are not delighting in the Lord's way, even though you are in that way, your children will see it. And they'll say, you know what, dad is not happy despite how much he says he's doing what God's telling him to do. He's obeying God. He's not doing it happily. It's grudgingly. He goes, you know what, if we would have moved and if, we would have got, if I would have gotten that job, we wouldn't be having this bill. I'd be driving a new car. We wouldn't have to worry about this or that. Instead, we stayed here because this is where the church is. Children see that. But it's not just fathers, and, and everyone has to make this decision. This, don't close your ears because you're not a father. Don't close your ears because this sermon isn't for you. No, every single one of us has to make the decision which way we will walk down. Each and every one of us has to decide who's going to order my steps, God or me. 
And if you're on the, on the edge, if you're on the fence, or maybe you don't have to make that decision yet. You don't have to separate from your Abraham. And you're on the fence not knowing which way you should go. Well, what will work best? Stop and think about Abraham and Lot. Do you want to order your own steps like Lot did? Do you want to take that chance that you'll end up as pitiful, as distraught, as destroyed as Lot was? Psalm 37 is not just words that David thought up. He had seen God stand by him, and he had seen the wicked perish. There was times in David's life where he looked, I'm sure he looked at the wicked. He wrote and said, Lord, why do the wicked prosper? David wrote that in his younger years. Lord, why do the wicked prosper? And why do the righteous, why, why are the righteous put down? Why are they destroyed? Why are they sought after? God, why? In Psalm 37, he says, I was young, now I am old. And I have not seen the righteous forgotten. I have not seen them forsaken. It might take some time. You might look out and say, why would I follow God when my peers want nothing to do with God and they are prosperous? They might die rich. I will tell you that. They, those people might die rich. But do you want to go to the same place they're going? Not everything is in this world. Not everything is what we can hold in our hand. There is eternity to consider as well. He had seen the wicked perish. I wonder if Lot had been able to read Psalm 37. If he would have stopped to consider the steps he was about to follow. If he would have stopped and said, Who wants this, me or God? Whose steps am I following? Abraham was not perfect, nor do we have to be to be good men. We will fall. It will happen. Sometime, for some reason in our life, every single one of us will do something that separates us from God in our relationship. And we will have to come to the point where we say, i got to get this right. Or we can just close our ears and sear our conscience and be like Lot. Remain in, remain in Sodom. See and hear those things. David says that God upholdeth him by the hand. David said, David recognized. The whole kingdom recognized. This is well after Bathsheba. This is well after idolatry. This is well after he ordered the murder of one of his mightiest men, a friend. David said, I've never seen the righteous for forsaken. Even if we fall, even if we stumble, God still holds on. That child that throws a tantrum that you just have to keep dragging along because you don't leave him behind. That's how, that's how I picture Nathan when he confronts David. David, what would you do in this case? And David became outraged. And he says, you are the man. At that moment, David was the toddler who had done wrong. And he's just getting drug along until he realizes, I need, I, I, I need to fix this. And David broke down. And he wept. There were still consequences. But eventually he got back up on his feet. And God called him a man after my own heart. Men, are you striving to be good men? Are you striving to be men whose steps are ordered by the Lord? Are you striving to be good examples? Lot's children were wicked and they became the fathers of wicked nations. Isaac had his own problems. Jacob had his own problems. The twelve sons had a lot of problems. But through that line came Jesus Christ. Are you being a good example? How will your children end up? For you yourself, how do you want to end up? It didn't take to Lot's children for destruction to happen. 
It happened in Lot's lifetime. Who is ordering your steps? And will you be delighted with the end of that path? Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I know this wasn't very encouraging. It wasn't a pick-me-up. It wasn't a, a rah-rah, let's get back to work, Lord. Lord, even from my own self, it makes you stop and wonder and stop and think. But Lord, we need that. We need that as people, and we especially need that as fathers. We need to recognize that there are times in our lives where we need to stop and consider the spiritual and not just the material of this world. Lord, I just pray that, that you would help us, Lord, to be good men, good people, good women. Lord, not, not perfect, Lord, we can't be that, but people who delight in your path, people who want to walk down your path. Lord, I do thank you for the fathers. Lord, I thank you for my father. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to be a good father. Lord, I just pray that you'd help all of us who have people that look up to us to be good examples for you. Help us to be joyful in the way. Help us to delight in the path. Help us, even in the hard times, to put a smile on our face and say, Isn't God good? I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Lord, I just pray that if there's anybody here that needs to get right with you, who needs to get back up on their feet and stop getting drug along. Lord, if there's somebody here who doesn't know you, has never stepped on that path, Lord, I pray that they would recognize the end of the wicked, the end of the sinful, and desire to have that path that leads to eternal life. Lord, I just pray that you guide and direct our lives. I thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, every head bowed and every eye closed, if you'd stand.